Oh yeah, I run my own company. Oh yes, I'm a businesswoman. That all sounds amazing, but in this video, I really wanna talk about what's behind that. Hi, my name is Marina, I'm 34 years old. I started my first company when I was 21. And in this video, I just wanna talk about things that I would tell myself if I decided to start business for the first time in 2024. But before we get to my actual business learnings, I wanna thank HubSpot for sponsoring this video. It's a wild journey, it's crazy, but it's so rewarding but there are certain things i want you to know before you start but i'm going to talk about everything so watch this video up to the very end quick background story when i was 21 i was still back in russia my home country and uh, my then boyfriend and i started an agency helping people study abroad and then we started helping people learn languages and that company transformed into an online booking platform called lingua trip we moved to silicon valley raised money from 500 startups and several other angel investors during covid our travel part shut down and it was never able to recover after that but we launched the online part which is doing really well right now and while running that company I also started another company called lingua marina which manages three of my youtube channels this one and a couple more and uh i was able to raise a venture round as a creator from a company called slow ventures here in silicon valley but today are my key learnings from doing business for 13 years i'm not that old it's crazy. Now, the first thing, when I was, I think I was 25 and we we're going through an accelerator in back in Russia and they asked us a very good question. They asked us why we were building the company and there were like three options. One, to sell it. Second, to keep it because we think it's a lifestyle business. And the third is to IPO. And when I looked at those options, I was like, of course, number two, like who starts a company to sell it? Who starts a company to, well, IPO could be possible, but like, Number two, I love it. This company is my child. And now I realize this is such a weird mindset for the first business. Yes, your first business could be something that you do for your whole life, but just having this mindset, oh my God, I'm stuck with this idea for the next 30 years, this is not the right mindset. And the more and more I talk to entrepreneurs, the more I realize that we were just lucky that our first business idea actually made sense because I went into the space that I absolutely loved and maybe I am that person who has to work on something I truly love, despite this not being the sexiest market in the world. And this is where you have to decide what type of mindset you have, what type of person you are. There are people like, I don't know, Kagan, there are people like Mark Zuckerberg who were just testing different ideas and uh, they try to see what sticks, what kind of problem uh, is the best to solve right now. And there are people like me who are like, I just understand you know, study abroad. Now I also understand social media and I just want to stick to it. I don't want to sell. I don't see myself without this company. And that's probably one of the reasons why I am still active in both companies. But it's just, you know, with the second approach, it may take you years before you find that right idea. So if you want to start a business now, just be ready to iterate through ideas, just go through them. I just recently talked to Raj from um, Solana. So he co-founded this blockchain, which is valued at I think 70 billion dollars and he started like nine companies in a year and all of them well some of them failed some of them took off without him with other co-founders but his mindset was i will keep looking for ideas until i find the one and it doesn't matter if i'm 95 i will still keep looking for ideas but luckily enough he founded solana but i also asked him about family like but how do you start a family if you have this mindset you can't just be iterating and having kids because it's just impossible he's like family was not on my roadmap because of that i was like okay so if you have this mindset, it's really hard with a family. So this mindset is does not apply for me because I always knew I wanted a family and I knew that for me, my business has to provide stability. Just think about where exactly you're at with your mindset and this will make everything so much easier for you because I was blaming myself for not chasing other ideas. I was like, maybe I should try this and that, another Silicon Valley hype until I realized like I have to fall in love with idea. I don't care if it's a billion dollar market, if it's sexy or not, all I care about is is that I care about people who have this problem and that's it. Now, once you realize what type of person you are and you start something and you're passionate about it, but how do you know when to stop? And I keep asking entrepreneurs this question as well, like when you know it's time to give up, when you know that it's not growing, etc. And there are several different rules that apply to Silicon Valley companies or businesses in general, because you don't have to be a Silicon Valley company to have a successful business. But what I'm taking away from all of the answers, you have to come up with a certain metric before you even start. For example, you're starting a business and you know that 
you have six months uh, worth of savings. And uh, in order to continue doing that, you need at least like 100 clients. That's your proof of concept. So come up with that number and it's okay to change it later. It's just very important to mentally understand where you want to stop. And for me with LinguaTrip, I'm like, okay, as long as it pays the bills, this is great. Like, I love it. I love the industry. In this video, I'm focusing more on your mindset and the right approach to starting a business rather than paperwork or detailed business plans. However, my hope is that you take action after watching this video. And in that case, you'll need more practical help with starting a company. That's why I recommend downloading this free templates from HubSpot in the description below. They will help you turn your idea into an actual business. It's actually a free business startup kit that includes a business name brainstorming workbook. Really important. Check the trademarks because you know, I made this huge mistake when I um, took a name LinguaTrip and it was actually trademarked in one of the countries. So we had to pay $20,000 to the person who owned it. So double check. So that workbook is really helpful. Business plan template, marketing plan template, and much more. Personally, I really like the eight elevator pitch templates from this kit because you will need to practice your elevator pitch because you're going to be pitching your idea to your friends, investors, and just random people. These are practice tested text structures. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just take the ready-made working texts and adapt them to your needs. This kit was made by HubSpot who's sponsoring today's video. Big thanks to them for providing this free resources. Point number two, set up a metric for you that will tell you when to stop because not every single idea becomes a business. And there are several metrics like Silicon Valley, you have to grow to X every month if you're just starting out, etc. There are different metrics and, and every VC will have their own, but you don't have to be a Silicon Valley company in order to be a successful company. So it's really important for you to decide how much time you have and uh, what makes an idea a good idea. So for example, for me, it was very crucial to be able to find our first clients and we're just lucky that, that our clients were studying with us. And that was a great proof of concept that if I want this product and if a couple of my friends want this product and uh, I understand like we are in a good university in Russia, etc. but I could predict how big the market was and that was enough for me. But if I start something and I just don't see any clients and I have no idea how I find them, that's a great question to ask yourself. Like, is it really viable? Does this idea have to exist? And I like what Noah Kagan told me during our interview. He was like, I would post on Reddit that, you know, I will give you a coupon for this app for this amount of dollars, or I will do this for you for this amount of dollars. And he started seeing what took off and, and what didn't. So come up with a metric that you can reach by easy tests, because sometimes we just don't know what success is and defining early success for yourself will really help you determine whether you're going to continue working on the idea or not. And right after this comes the problem that a lot of new entrepreneurs are facing. And I was facing it honestly, selling and letting people go. But selling comes first because you have to make the product work. And it was so difficult for me. That was such a hard thing to do, like selling the product. And I was 21 years old. I was basically a kid selling trips for $2,000 and I had to sound professional and I was talking to parents and they were like 40 plus years old and they were like CEOs of companies and I had to sound very professional. That was really tough for me. But some things that really helped me uh, doing those first sales, I knew that I was in love with the product and I knew the result. I was basically selling them the result. I wasn't selling them the trip. I wasn't asking them their money. I was like, I went on such a trip when I was 14 and it completely changed my life. It helped me with my English. I went to this Olympiad and I won it. It's just amazing. It is very important that you sell the result then it makes a sale so much easier. But also don't forget that repeat customers are everything. So don't overpromise. On average, it costs five to 25 more times to attract a new client versus making your old customer buy something else. So just make sure that you're not overselling, that you're not over promising. I always have this philosophy that we have to over deliver with the products. And if I ever see a negative review, I send it to my team, I ask them to explain, like I dive really deep into what's going on. I try to dive deep as long as I can and improve the processes because at the end of the day, the reputation of your company is everything. And yes, while you're small, you can experiment and make mistakes, but also when you're small, you're kind of determining the set of rules for you, the set of morals that will help you make decisions easier. And it doesn't work this way that 
oh, in this situation, I will, you know, negotiate with a client because he's uh, an asshole. And in this situation, I will just give them a discount because they're nice. It doesn't work that way. The thing is, when you have uh, double standards for different clients or different situations, you just spend so much mental energy on thinking what type of situation that is. So it was really important for me from the beginning of our business to set up certain morals or certain rules that I follow. And um, it just makes decision making easier. Like one of those rules I'm always trying to help, like as long as I can make an intro and I'm not thinking like, oh, I'm gonna help this person be successful and uh, uh, they're not gonna pay me back. Yeah, they're probably not gonna pay me back, but the universe is gonna pay me back in some way, hopefully. And when you're just starting your journey and the best time to come up with this set of rules is when you first encounter the situation, when you're just starting a business. Oh, what am I gonna do later on? Like when I'm a million dollar company, when everyone's watching. There was one advice that my investor gave me. Uh, he was like, Marina, when you don't know what to do, think that Wall Street Journal is gonna cover this in their article and they're gonna dig into everything. So always think that the Wall Street Journal is watching you so you don't wanna mess up. I hope this helps. This might sound like a cliche, but well, Sorry, you have to grow your social media as an entrepreneur. You have to be a producer for your own image as an entrepreneur. You will also have to produce your company's social media and just understanding the rules by which the industry is playing right now and they're constantly changing. So it's not like you figured it out and you stop and then it works for years. Unfortunately, everything changes every couple months. The algorithm changes. So if you ask me, I think every entrepreneur has to have some kind of social media presence because this is how people not only find out about you but also find out about your company and your audience is a great base to test your new ideas you can ask them if they actually have this problem and a lot of products at lingua trip were actually inspired by our audience they were like oh we really need to study online but i was like no learning languages abroad is the best way why would you study online but when they asked us for a skype teacher uh, it was back in the day for like uh 20th time, I was like, okay, we need to think about that. Um, so the best ideas also come from your customers. The best video ideas come from the comment section. So, so really try to start playing the social media game no matter where you are in your journey. If you're already building something, document that. If you're not building something, document your thoughts. Like I'm thinking of leaving my job. And by the way, speaking of leaving your job, I would never leave a job to just think about ideas and brainstorm them. The best ideas, you will find energy to work on them regardless of what's happening on your job like you will find time on weekends the best ideas you just cannot not work on them you just have to i've heard a lot of those stories when people started when they were working full-time i was lucky enough i was i started when i was studying full-time and it was easier because you know i could walk out of the classes i could take calls in the university corridor i was around people who were potentially my clients uh but i still had to be there from nine to six every day. It was just more flexible. But now if you're working from home, why not? Let's talk about delegating. Because I started a business as a 21 year old with no upfront investment. Our investment was like $300 to start an LLC. We had to pay the lawyer. I come from the background where, you know, I have to try to do everything by myself first and then delegate it. And I think if it's your first business idea, this is the way to go. Like try to post on social media to see what it looks like, what it takes. Because otherwise somebody comes in and tells you like, I'm gonna charge you $3,000 for three reels. And you'll be like, oh, maybe that's how much it costs. Okay, take my money. And then they're not performing. But if you know what it takes to create a reel, and if you know what it takes to create a good reel, then you can negotiate and tell like, hey, no, I can delegate this to people in uh, other countries and they're gonna charge me $25 for the whole video. And honestly, because you're starting this, no one can do better marketing and sales rather than you because you you are the DNA of this company. You are basically the product of this company if you are a type like me who wants to build something they are passionate about. So if I were you, I would start by doing everything by myself, but at some stage you stop and you start delegating. And the worst mistake is to start delegating too late because that means you're wasting your energy on day to day instead of strategy. So at some stage, and this is my favorite thing to do every day, when I do something, ask myself a question. Do I have to be doing this? or can somebody else do this? So when I'm filming this video, I know for this channel, it's me. For Lingua Marina, we have a teacher and sometimes she replaces me. Our students don't mind, they love her. I keep asking myself this question, do I have to edit the video? Do I have to translate all the documents? That was 2011. Oh my God, this is crazy. I used to translate everything by myself and now we have DeepL and all of these things and all of the other things. 
but you ask yourself, do I have to be doing this or I can hire someone? If you're in the US, please do not forget that you can hire abroad. I met so many American entrepreneurs who were like, but I like, how do I hire abroad? Independent international contractors. You can hire them by yourself. You can hire them using businesses who are valued at billions of dollars, like deal.com. They help you structure everything. Uh, there are other startups who help you find talent abroad and you pay a fraction of cost. Do that, especially for remote tasks. It's just a game changer to your business. And when people ask me, Marina, how many people help you make these videos? And I tell them like 30, 40, they're like, oh my God. And I tell them like, they're not in the US. They're all over the world. It's not like I have to pay them Silicon Valley prices. So my business is smaller than you think. Yes, but because everyone's abroad. I know Charlie Chang has started his company called Paired.so where they help you hire abroad and they just helped us hire a video editor in Indonesia and they charge $5 an hour. I don't know where you're waiting for. Go explore international talent. But before you start exploring, you have to understand the task and ideally create an instruction, like a PDF uh, that your new contractor will follow. Like, oh, if I'm talking to this client, I did this, this, and that. This is our tone of voice. This is our style. I remember it took me a while to create all of those, but it made my life so much easier. And so for every function now, we have those instructions. And when they come in and they receive a new instruction, they will just update the file. And it's very easy for me when some somebody graduates from their job, somebody new comes in, they already have all of the updated instructions and I don't really have to spend too much time onboarding them. So make sure you are focusing on your superpower and your superpower is just driving this business to the moon and making sure you're helping people save their problem. The team should be doing the rest. I participated in this two day intensive management training back in Dubai last year and uh, we were discussing top entrepreneurs and uh, top entrepreneurs spend most of their time hiring, talking to candidates, doing interviews because their job is to find the best people to make things things happen at their company and they are the vision. Let's talk about network. Let's talk about ways I lost my precious time when I was starting my business. When we just moved to Silicon Valley, we went into this accelerator and I got distracted by all of the parties that we got invited to. I thought it was very important to network, though I didn't have any ask. I was kind of fundraising, but I knew that going to startup parties doesn't really help you fundraise because everyone is kind of just thinking about their idea or just starting out. And I was just going and going to those parties until I realized I had to be working on the product. So networking is important. And now I spend maybe 30 to 40% of my active work time networking, uh, going to conferences, having meetings with companies and just meeting people in general. But the foundation is actually the product that I've built. And now networking is an essential part of my job. But when you just start out, you don't really have to network. The time when you have to start networking is when you start having clear ask. That could be fundraising or maybe you you are stuck in your journey as an entrepreneur, you don't know how to hire and you want other entrepreneurs in your circle who can teach you how to hire or recommend places where to hire. So networking can be kind of distracting when you see others post on Instagram, oh, I'm networking, whatever. If you don't have a clear ask, nothing will come out of that networking. People, especially in the US, are very business oriented. If there is no business, there is no need to spend your time and other people's time. Love your mistakes. So I lost money somewhere. I made a stupid mistake. I lost money and I caught myself not really worrying about it because it was a business mistake. I tried something and uh, I failed. And and I realized that it's actually great quality because I remember seven years ago when I made a huge mistake and I lost back then a lot of money. I spent much more time trying to chase that company that defrauded me and I kind of won, but I didn't get my money back. But the thing is, what I realized is a successful entrepreneur actually loves their mistakes. Yes, you ask yourself why this happened. What did I learn from it? How can I prevent this from happening in the future? But you're not punishing yourself for, for these mistakes. You're not telling yourself that you're not built for this. Like, don't even go there. The best entrepreneurs, they view mistakes as the best lessons. So whenever I make a mistake, and again, I'm a, I'm a very emotional person. If I'm wrong, if something goes bad in the business, if the client is unhappy, if there is a bad review, like my first uh, natural instinct is scream and like tell everyone how did that happen or blame myself for not being attentive 
enough to detail whatever but then i tell myself like it's actually great that they told some negative things about our company because now i see them and we can fix them if they were just quiet maybe you know i wouldn't notice it so of course bad reviews happen or mistakes happen and uh, hiring wrong people happens but if you compare marina now with marina 10 years ago in 2014 like my hiring decisions back then i felt like i was a three-year-old now my team is amazing like and back then i would just promote a social media person and make them the coo that was the type of manager i was i've learned the hard way even if i took the course 10 years ago i would say like nah i know better this social media person is amazing they're gonna run the company to the moon a uh, billion dollar valuation that was how i thought so i'm telling this to you now not because you need to question your hiring decisions you probably won't question them after watching this video but if you later realize that this was a mistake just praise yourself and tell yourself this is how i'm becoming a better manager i know it's hard again remembering all of my emotions that i had when i made mistakes it's really hard this is how you learn and this is what makes your journey exciting and uh, and at the end of the day entrepreneurs are people who don't like stability they like ups like crazy ups and crazy downs this is what makes our life interesting and exciting this is what gives us joy and adrenaline i'm wishing you all the best on your journey thank you so much for watching silicon valley girl please subscribe and share this video with your entrepreneur friends and see you soon bye